By the summer of 1884, some of the wagons were prepared to roll. All five sets weren't ready at once because it took a while to cure and dry the wood so wheels and wagons wouldn't shrink in the dry desert air. But by 1884, some of Coleman's new 20 mule team outfits actually left first from the Amargosa works since it was summer and Harmony was shut down. It was a 10-day trip of 165 miles from Amargosa or Harmony to the railhead of Mojave. The journey began from Amargosa or Harmony once the 11 tons of sacked borax was loaded into the wagons. In the early morning on the first day, the Teamster and Swamper brought the mules and horses from Greenland Ranch and hitched up the team. By dawn, they left Harmony, traveling for half the day, stopping at noon to water and feed the animals. Then they moved on to places like Tule Springs and Salt Wells, where the water, said Ed Stiles, was salty but good enough for mules and tough mule drivers. There were dangers like flash floods, wind and cold, and the intense heat, which killed at least one teamster. They had to repair wagons and watch over 80 hooves of mules and horses. If wagons needed fixing or shoes replaced, they began travel as early as one in the morning to arrive at the next stop with enough daylight to repair the shoes or the wagons. From Salt Wells, they began an uphill climb through Wingate Pass. Here, they often unhitched the wagons, hooked the full team to just one wagon, and took them up one at a time. Turning a corner was another challenge. When approaching a turn, the team would begin to drift normally, to the left or the right. Depending on how sharp the turn was determined how many mules would have to jump the chain. Jumping the chain meant that some of the mules would jump over the heavy chain that ran between the team connecting the mules to the wagons. The mules that jumped the chain pulled in the opposite direction from the rest of the team. Most important were the pointers attached to the front of the wagon tongue. They were responsible for steering the wagons. The pointers and other mules that jumped the chain would take the wagons out far enough around to safely make the turn, avoiding an obstacle or preventing going over an embankment. Once the wagons made the bend, the mules jumped back over the chain and pulled the wagon straight. It was perhaps one of the most extraordinary sights on the desert, and few were there to see it. From Wingate Pass, they went to Lone Willow Springs, the halfway point in days, though not in miles. Here, there were large tanks to hold the water pipe down from the spring on the hill. Then it was on to Owl Hole Junction, then on to the landmark visible from nearly every vantage point in the region, Pilot Knob. At its base was Granite Wells, where Ed said was good water, if there were no dead coyotes in it. Each stop had a feed box with food for the men and animals. Wandering prospectors often raided the boxes, though some were kind enough to later replace what they had taken. The borax you're hauling weighs 22 tons, but it feels From like Granite Wells, the route turned west, descending steeply. Once on the desert plain, it was three dry camps on a long, dusty, and hot trail hot enough sometimes for the teams to travel at night. Here, water wagons would be transported from springs to the dry camps, and the team often was comprised of the three familiar wagons. Then around 3 p.m. on the 10th day, they were greeted by the sight of a rail car painted with the single word, Mojave. 
At Mojave, the borax was emptied into freight cars for shipment to San Francisco for refining and packaging. It's a life that we've chosen. We make the rules. We're the teamsters who haul the Mojave. Today, the town of Mojave is still a crossroads town, as you can see. And it was here where the mule teams ended their 10-day journey from Death Valley. This monument, which was dedicated in 1958, is the only remaining evidence of what was once here. At this very site stood the stalls to feed the mules and the barn to store the supplies and hay. In the 1950s, the buildings were moved to the Borax Museum in Death Valley, where they can still be seen to this day. But in the 1880s, when the teams were arriving here on a regular basis, the Mojave that they would have encountered was nothing less than a rough and rugged western town. Ed Stiles recalled, Mojave was no sissy town. It was a rendezvous town for Searles Borax drivers, Nadeau's freighters from the Sarah Gorda silver mines, and similar outfits. Every alternate building on that main street, a half street, facing the railroad was a saloon. Now it took a man-sized drink to clear out a throat that had been caked with that alkali for 10 days. The Teamsters were paid when they arrived, earning $100 to $120 a month. The Swampers made $75. In their one free afternoon and evening, most of the men gambled away their earnings at a card betting game called Pharaoh. John Perry noted, well, it was a good thing for us, for the Teamsters could go broke in one night and be ready to go out over the road in the morning. There was no fear of men taking their pay and leaving. At the end of each trip, it was also customary to ask the men whether they were getting along with each other. Any disagreement led to a change of personnel, and there was good reason for this. One day in 1886, Al Bryson and his swamper, Sterling Wassum, had made camp and Bryson was in a bad mood because the mules were hard to manage. And now he couldn't open a can of roast beef for lunch. He cussed out Wassum for not keeping the knife sharp. Wassum cursed back, and Bryson threatened him with the knife. Wassum got the shovel off the wagon, came back and hit Bryson, killing him instantly. He buried him in a shallow grave and tried to drive the team. He couldn't. He overturned the wagons. He unhitched a mule to ride into town. When he arrived without his teamster, he was arrested. But no judge wanted to go to Death Valley to investigate, and Swamper Wassum was acquitted. And then there's the teamster who went to hear an evangelist preach and was converted. The next morning, when he mounted the wagon and tried to get the team to move, the mules all cocked their ears forward and stared at him, quite puzzled. He had omitted the customary colorful cuss words from his command. From 1884 to 1888, the 20 mule teams were in full operation. Five teams were on the road at all times, hauling two million pounds of borax a year. Two fully loaded wagons of borax were worth about $100,000 in today's money. One team pulled into Mojave as another team pulled out, carrying supplies back to the valley. It was so efficient that later the borax company boasted that in five years of operation, not a mule or a wagon was lost. In 1887, Coleman Sons and a trusted friend convinced him to try and corner the raisin market. When prices of raisins and borax dropped, he lost over one million dollars. He tried to sell off his Death Valley borax property to pay his debts, but the deal fell through. After only five years of operation, on May 7, 1888, the Harmony Borax and Amargosa Works shut down, never to resume. Death Valley's 20 mule team days were over. <laughs>